The coronavirus is pushing more women to seek illegal abortions as lockdowns limit health care. There are 25 million unsafe abortions every year, almost half all terminations worldwide. And now the pandemic is eroding hopes of progress. Argentina's president promised to decriminalize abortion, a first for Latin America. But the outbreak has put the reform on hold indefinitely. Colombia was also close to legalizing abortion. Instead, a top court has ruled against it. In developing countries, one in three terminations is carried out in dangerous conditions. Women in Africa are at the highest risk of dying from an unsafe abortion. The statistics aren't nice, but they're a reality, whether you're for or against abortion, and not even factoring in lockdowns. Sure, the restrictions have exacerbated the situation, but this isn't anything new. Each year in Kenya, two and a half thousand girls and women die from unsafe abortions. It's a leading cause of maternal mortality, especially in low-income families. Our Nairobi correspondent Mahel Muller met a survivor in the Matari slum. We call her Mercy, but that's not her real name. She was 16 when she fell pregnant. Her mother wanted her to finish school, so she forced Mercy to abort the baby. For fear of repercussions, she hides her face. I went to a local medicine man. I stayed there for three days. He gave me herbal medicine and I took it. On the second day, I started seeing blood. I was very afraid. There are people who were bought and they seem fine. I thought I would die. It's estimated that in Kenya, seven women die each day from unsafe abortions. Abortions are illegal unless the mother's life or health is in danger or if there's a rape case. That's why women come to this man. He's well known for carrying out abortions, <coughs> along with other procedures, even though he has no medical training. Mercy came here too. She paid the equivalent of eight euros for the abortion. In the interview, however, he denies performing abortions. But still, he wants to hide his identity. They're given an injection, a drug, and they're sent home so that the pregnancy can terminate there. Many of these women die. If they're unlucky, they do die. If they're lucky, the pregnancy terminates safely. It's usually bad, however. In most cases, women need professional help after the abortion. The international aid organization Marie Stopes is one of several NGOs in Kenya that offers these post-abortion care services. But there's a lot of uncertainty, says Daisy Adela. We don't have clear guidelines, national guidelines, on managing these post-abortion care services or even safe abortion services. Therefore, uh, this stigma that envelops us goes down now to this woman or girl who has no option and doesn't know where to turn to. Of course, Mercy would have preferred to see a real doctor. Three years later, she is still suffering from the traumatic experience. Because those men will just give you some kind of medicine and then tell you when the pregnancy has been terminated. They only want your money. In the end, you're the one who has to suffer. Despite the stigma she faces from her community, she thinks every woman should have the right to a safe abortion. Audrey Kawiri Wawiri is Senior Press Officer at Human Rights Watch East Africa. So how has COVID exacerbated the situation? Thank you. You know, pandemics always uh, have an adverse effect to maternal health. We saw with the Ebola pandemic in Sierra Leone, um, maternal health access was very limited. And now with the coronavirus pandemic, the, the same is happening. Um, the UNFPA is warning that with the disruptions and the lack of access to contraceptions, um, in middle-income countries, in low-income countries, about 7 million, there'll be about 7 million unintended pregnancies pregnancies. And this is the time for governments to step in and start addressing maternal health, even as they're thinking of coronavirus. 
because um, we, we are seeing women right now having to be discharged from hospital much faster. And hospitals are also trying to social distance and, you know, put in all the measures to prevent coronavirus um, infections. So this really limits how they can care for women uh, who are coming in to give birth or who are coming in just for the care before they give birth or even after. And of course, the, the shortages in medical supplies has affected uh, contraception and uh, even condom manufacturing companies are warning of shortages. So of course, this will greatly affect how people can prevent pregnancies. And you also see in other places like Italy and Poland, governments are taking care, uh, taking advantage of the pandemic to um, completely cut off access to abortions. OK, that, that's the health care side of things. What about the educational side of things, the link between education and teen pregnancy, for example? Yes. So before the pandemic, many countries, especially in Africa, were already struggling with teen pregnancies. And if I can give an example of Kenya, um, a few months ago, two months ago, um, some counties in Kenya released data of pregnant teenagers, and we saw this in the thousands, tens of thousands girls who are now pregnant. And while the government showed some concern and, you know, acknowledged that this has happened, we did not see any efforts to ensure that these girls will be considered when schools are reopening. And even now, when there are discussions about how schools will reopen, there are no special considerations being outlined on how these girls will go back to school and what happens to their education. So fine, a lot of the year this year has already been lost due to the pandemic, but there are children who are, you know, locked up sometimes with their abusers or they were having sex because they did not, you know, uh, have information or, you know, uh, other reasons. But now we need to address the fact that the, the children need to go back to school and what's the government going to make sure that they are not left behind whenever schools reopen. Or, Audrey, just tell me, how, how can education help a girl, though, raped by a family member in lockdown? So all children have a right to education, right? And the lockdown did force some of these children to be locked down with um, children, with people who are abusing them. And if you're, if, if a girl, if a child is receiving comprehensive sexual education, then they are very clear on about their bodies, about what's acceptable, about what consent means, and about where to get help. So some of these steps are it's part of education. Some of these steps can help a girl, a child, uh, seek help, report, and talk freely about what's going on with them. But even so, we need to secure their education after the pandemic. And apart from that, the stigma around abortion is, uh, I guess, one of the biggest problems facing uh, many young women. Um, there's a lot of stigma around abortion, but you see, this is coming about from laws and policies that uh, prevent abortion, but that does not actually stop abortions. It just makes it uh, more difficult to access. Therefore, the people who are seeking abortions are not getting them from qualified uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare providers. And so when they do procure the abortion, it's unsafe. And, and people do see uh, others suffering, um, bleeding so much, or even losing their lives. So this just perpetuates mm. the stigma. But access to safe abortion is actually uh, health care that can be provided to people who are going to give birth and, you know, limit the kind of stigma and misinformation that comes with it. Audrey Kawira Wawira, Senior Press Officer at Human Rights Watch East Africa. Thank you. Thank you. And let me hand you over to Derek Williams, who's been busy researching answers to your questions on the coronavirus. What if no vaccine is successful? What would be the path forward? 
The speed at which vaccines are being developed for COVID-19 is, is breathtaking. Um, there are over 150 of them in trials of some sort, with, with dozens of them in testing in humans. And, and though that might seem like overkill, um, it's not. That's because under normal circumstances, where development takes many years, um, less than 10% of vaccine candidates for other diseases end up receiving approval. So lots of the ones aimed at COVID-19 are not going to work out, um, almost certainly the majority. But, but what happens if, if none of them do? Um, it's a scary scenario, and it's one that most experts uh, don't consider likely, but I, I suppose it's certainly a possibility. So let's look for a second at what that would mean. If a vaccine remains elusive, we'll have to continue to try to fight the virus by helping and healing the people who become infected with, with treatments like newly developed or, or repurposed drugs that, that improve outcomes. Um, there are still just a couple of compounds being used widely in COVID-19 treatment, and, and they only help seriously ill patients. So if it takes longer than we think to develop a vaccine, we're going to need more therapies. And, and then a big goal would be to nail down early stage treatments that prevent the disease from progressing to deadly later stages. Um, some of the most promising potential alternatives in this direction are around a dozen repurposed antivirals, uh, but also an immune system protein called um, interferon beta, as well as artificially produced antibodies called MABs uh, for monoclonal antibodies. Researchers are racing to test those compounds and others, and it's likely that at least some of them will pan out. So, so even if a vaccine doesn't, we should still be able to save many more lives in the future um, with more effective treatments for, for people who catch the disease.